everyone, and welcome to the Voices of Forestry podcast. I'm your host, Seth Stevenson, the Communications Coordinator with the Arkansas Forestry Association. We are back this month with a new topic and a new discussion, but not quite a new voice of forestry. We'll get a little bit more into that here in a second. But I do want to thank our sponsors this month, Farm Credit, for their support of the show. We're going to hear a little bit more from them later on in this episode. So today I'm actually joined again by AFA Executive Vice President Max Braswell. He's here today to kind of talk with us about our AFA annual meeting and some of the topics that we discussed during our general session. We're considering this episode a bit of an AFA annual meeting grab bag, if you will. So Max, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks Seth. It's been good to uh, listen to you. do these uh, for the last few years and good to be back with you today. All right. So we, like I said, we're kind of, we just had our AFA annual meeting, our 78th annual meeting in Oaklawn and Hot Springs here in Arkansas. And what we wanted to do for this episode is kind of go through our general session uh, that we have every year for, uh, as a part of our meeting and talk about some of the topics that were discussed just as a as an intro to these topics with the hopes that maybe we can get some of these folks who are at the meeting back on the show to go a little bit more in depth. Uh, so but, but before we do that, we, we kind of wanted to talk about why we have an AFA annual meeting to begin with. So Max, I'm going to let you kind of talk about that and, and why this is something our association chooses to do every year. Yeah, and, and we always want to remember that we talk about these subjects on the podcast with the idea that the people mm-hmm. listening to us, they're not going to show up at the annual meeting probably, and they may be wondering, well, why are you talking about your annual meeting? But the things that we do as an association and at, and the, the things that we talk about um, at our annual meeting are all s- still geared towards creating healthy forests, mm-hmm. good forest management out there. So I think you're kind of, as we've talked about it, we're kind of letting you see behind the curtain of why we do the things that we do, why we talk about the things that we do, and how they ultimately benefit good forest health and good sustainable forest management in the state. So we get together every year. Uh, it's the largest gathering of forestry professionals, private landowners, uh, forestry leaders in the state, Somewhere in the neighborhood of 250, we've had close to 300 people gather. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to network. It is an opportunity for us to trade information, learn from each other. And then we bring speakers in who are sort of experts in their field, um, and they provide information to us, again, so that we can learn from them. Um, we are, are able to provide continuing education credits because mm-hmm. this is important, particularly to the registered forester community. And so we do all of that over the course of three days each year, this time in our one of our, fam- our favorite places, Hot Springs, uh, so that, again, we can focus on the things that are happening now out there on the forest landscape, look into the future so that we can prepare to once again continue to manage those forests for a multitude of objectives. And then we walk away from that, we hope, Uh, better prepared to provide everything that the folks who depend on forests uh, expect Mm -hmm. from us. And we also have a forest management workshop, which happens on the first day of our annual meeting, which is a a three-day event. So we do offer landowners an opportunity and and forest management professionals to to get a little bit more information. uh, So it's not really it's not one of the, our bigger bigger draws, but we do offer multiple opportunities for education uh, throughout our annual meeting, just to a, a wide variety of folks. But we're today we're focusing mainly on our general session, not that forest management workshop. Well, but I would I would say one of the things that's important about that forest management workshop, again for those listening, is that there is a forest ethics component mm-hmm. to that. Yes, we do that every year at the annual meeting, and it also happens at multiple training opportunities throughout the year. Uh, Registered foresters, those forestry professionals that we depend on to help us manage those properties, they have a set of criteria that they have to meet in order to maintain that uh, professional certification Mm -hmm. or accreditation. And so we want folks to know that our professional foresters out there do uh, operate under a code of ethics 
Um, they want to do the right things. They want to operate ethically. And so we provide an ethics training opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, which should uh, ensure folks that when those folks are going out on the landscape, you're working with someone that you can trust. Yes, exactly. And now the, the idea of a forestry association having an annual meeting is also not unique to Arkansas. A lot of our friends here in the South, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, have, have their own versions of an annual meeting. Um, so this just to kind of show that we're not the only ones doing something like this. This is happening all across, at least the South, uh, the Southern Forestry Associations. But let's hop into our general session. That's, we just kind of wanted to uh, start this conversation off with why we do something like this every year. So we're going to hop into our general session agenda here and kind of go through each one of these. Like I said, we're not going to go super in-depth because uh, Max and I are by no means the professionals when it comes to these, <laughs> these topics, but we do kind of want to just to pitch these out here as a as a stepping stone of sorts to hopefully get some of these folks on the, on the show in the future. But the first guest that we had for our general session this year was Dr. Kyle Cunningham, who is Arkansas's new state forester. Uh, he's with the Arkansas Department of Agriculture Forestry Division, and he just kind of gave his vision for what he hopes to do with the forestry division. He started this position this year, here about mid of this year, if that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so he kind of started this year. So Max, if you could give us a little quick recap of what uh, Kyle had, had to say. Yeah, and and uh, Dr. Cunningham, we say Dr. Cunningham because he's earned those it's credentials. Yes, yes. But we'll say Kyle because mm -hmm. Kyle is a longtime friend mm -hmm. of ours. We've worked with him in his previous stint with the, the extension mm -hmm. uh, service. Uh, very much has been willing to lend his expertise uh, in training sessions, uh, helping us understand particularly the hardwood industry for a number of years. Uh, but the forestry division and, and his role as the state forester that's a key partner uh, and a key collaborator with AFA. And, and so the reason it's important to hear from him is because the forestry division provides the on-the-ground services that AFA members, private landowners in particular, depend on. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Seth, you and I, we're not foresters. Mm -hmm. We're not experts. Oh, no. But the folks at the forestry division are. They are the professional foresters that go out there. And so to have a new state forester uh, is a pretty big deal. And to understand Kyle's vision for the, div for the forestry division was a big deal. Um, and so we wanted to hear from him. You know, they're out there to primarily conserve and protect and enhance the public benefits that we get from Timberland. Uh, and so he touched on pretty much every facet of what the forestry division does. They really focus on about three key areas. They're huge in uh, administering prescribed fire mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the state, uh, and and we have a real need for that. Uh, Absolutely, I think their number one reason for being is wildland fire suppression. Mm -hmm. we, we've heard about forest fires forever. They're the folks in the state of Arkansas who take care of business when we have a wildland or, or a fire on, on timberlands in the state. Mm -hmm. And they have the resources and the expertise not only to do that here in Arkansas, but we've had folks go all across the country out of our state because of the skill um, and the willingness they have to put themselves into those uh, dangerous situations on a lot of times. I think we even had some people sent out here not too long ago. The yes. governor sent out some folks. To, was it Louisiana? They've been mistaken. in Louisiana. Yeah. They, Of course, we think of wildland fire a lot in the West, and mm -hmm. we've had some folks out West in, in uh, multiple states there over the course of the last couple of years. And then another important piece of the puzzle that he shared with us is their ongoing and continued commitment to what we uh, know as the collection of uh, forest inventory analysis or FIA data. This is uh, a very important database. This is where we're able to collect all of the information that you could possibly imagine about the makeup of our forests. They look at about 20% of the forests each year. And so they are the collectors and the, uh, the housers mm -hmm. of our forest inventory analysis data. We can see growth versus removals. We can see the species makeup of the state. Um, the, it relates to the mills and the products that we're making out of there. Uh, and so basically, you know, he shared his vision for continuing to provide those key, key services to us, uh, to be efficient in what they do, um, to, to basically remember 
the who they are and what they're here to do and deliver mm-hmm. on that. And again, it's important for us to hear about that because those are the professionals on the ground. Those are the people that we depend on. Uh, and so we want to continue to have that strong collaborative relationship with the forestry division. And I think, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong here, Max, but it seemed like Kyle, Dr. Cunningham's kind of vision and what he, he was talking about during the session was very, uh, very positive. He felt like they were in a good spot. You know, there's always going to be a little bit of uh, growing pains when you get a new head of any kind of division, especially a state division. But luckily, Kyle's worked very closely with the Forestry Division and us over the past couple of years, so hopefully it won't be too much. But he felt like they were in a very good spot moving forward. Other than just like everybody else in our industry, the people that Kyle has on his team, um, you really can't have enough of those folks. Mm-hmm. We, we want to be supportive of them, make sure that the resources are there. Uh, and that's an ongoing challenge. It's been here for a number of years. Our mills face it. Uh, we'll talk about workforce development a mm-hmm. little bit later, um, but uh, but other than just the the human resources and making sure you've got enough folks on hand, Kyle is absolutely equipped to lead that division into the into the next generation of of providing service. Okay, well let's move on to our next guest that we had. It was Tim Gables with ArborGen. He came uh, and stopped to talk with us about forest economics for survival. Um, it. it his discussion seemed to kind of resonate a little bit. If, if you audience remember our discussion with Greg Hay, just kind of forest advanced forestry genetics. He spoke a little bit about that in general is a lot of kind of the same stuff we had, we had heard previously, but Max, can you just kind of give us a, another quick recap of some of the things that he talked about besides the advanced genetics stuff? Sure. And, and one of the things that we know coming out of every annual meeting is that our members uh, who represent the forestry sector as a whole, they are very interested in timber markets. They want to know, uh, you know what kind of opportunities are they going to have to uh, grow that timber and do it in the most scientifically, sustainably efficient manner, uh, manner possible so that they can get a good return on their investment. What are the markets going to be for them to be able to sell that timber when it's time to harvest it? Um, and we called it economics for survival because it seems like we're always going through the ups and downs mm-hmm. of being in a cyclical industry. And you've just got to be able to understand the marketplace and understand the landscape so that you can get from the highs through the lows, maybe to the next high. And we haven't had a lot of highs, particularly, but when it comes to uh, maybe pulpwood prices, you know, timber prices and things like that. But Tim did a great job of sort of laying out um, what was happening in the marketplace right now, uh, what were some of the success stories. Uh, Railroad ties and Mm -hmm. poles are a couple of products that the market has continued to be good. But, you know, timber is an important commodity in the state of Arkansas. So that's why it's important for us to know what's going on in our world from a market perspective. Um, you know, he was able to share some of the current state of our forest products infrastructure. And we looked at sort of the ratio of the number of mills in Arkansas and across the South that have opened or are expanding versus those that have announced closure or reductions. That's important to know because Mm -hmm. one of the things that we really need in this state and across the South is more forest products infrastructure. We have perfected the art of growing trees, and Tim spoke to advanced genetics and how we know how to grow excellent trees now the problem is is that we do such a good job and we have so many trees growing out there per acre uh, that we don't have enough forced infrastructure force the the mills to utilize those products Um, and so knowing that we have more capacity coming on board it's important for us and it's good to know and he was able to, to 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 share that kind of information you know hopefully this This housing shortage that we're seeing right now, uh, high interest rates, Mm -hmm. a lot of demand for housing, not a lot out there on the market. You know, we would hope that that would drive a good housing market in the future, which would that's good, good things for everybody in this particular business. Um, And so just really, you know, uh, our folks know that our world is changing um, and how are we going to continue to adapt uh, to it 
and provide the products that folks depend on on a daily basis. So relating this back to our folks maybe outside of the forestry industry that are that could be listening, why is it important for the markets for us to have good timber markets just in general? Well, in and in so many words, we equate good timber markets with good forest health mm -hmm. because uh, and, and we've talked about it. But just to reiterate, you know, we have a lot of trees growing out there. We're growing 60 percent more pine and hardwood fiber annually than we're harvesting. Over time, that's not sustainable. And we can look at natural occurrences like disease, insects, fire, those types of things as the as the forest gets more dense, have a bigger impact when they do occur. Timber markets provide an opportunity to harvest some of those trees to do the thinnings that we need that allow those forests over the long term to be more healthy, which mm -hmm. is what we all want out there. So timber markets equate to good forest health. It also equates to those timberland owners keeping our forests in forests mm -hmm. because they have a market when it's time to harvest and when it's when they need a return on their investment they have a market they have a place to take that wood fiber all of those things work together we've seen it we know that that is the case and so that's why the a good timber market uh, is important not only to the people who get a return, but also to those folks that are depending on our forests for aesthetics and water quality and wildlife habitat, uh, because it gives us a reason to go out there and manage that forest in a sustainable way. Okay. All right. Well, Max, I tell you what, before we move on to our next guest uh, for our general session, we're going to actually take a quick short sponsor break and thank our sponsors this month, Farm Credit. Farm Credit understands all things ag, including timber. Rural America has trusted Farm Credit for reliable, long-term financing for more than 100 years. Financing farms, timber, rural homes, agribusinesses, and more is all they do, which means they do it really well. Farm Credit is committed to the timber industry. They have experienced staff who understand the financing needs of timber producers and timber operations. Call Farm Credit today for long-term competitive rates that will support your timber operations success. Farm Credit of Western Arkansas, the timber lending specialist, equal housing lender. Thank you once again to Farm Credit for their continued support of the show. So we're moving on to our third guest of our general session here during the AFA annual meeting, and that was Mr. Philip Blauer with Warehouser. And this one's a bit of a doozy. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to tee this up right quick as a bit of a doozy. Uh, he came and talked to us about carbon capture technology and opportunities for landowners. And this one is very scientific. Uh, and, and again, we're going to reiterate, we are by no means the experts, especially when it comes to carbon capture technology. But I found this one to be very interesting about, you know, what technology they're using and how they're storing the carbon in our, in our space, because this has been a hot topic for our folks and for a lot of people here in the past couple of years. So Max, if you could uh, give us your best recap of, of Mr. Blauer's uh, presentation. Yeah, and I'll reiterate that we've got two radio TV guys <laughs> sitting here <laughs> yeah. talking about this stuff the this morning. The least science and math yeah. people you can find. Uh, and I did that because I knew I wouldn't have to do math or science. So uh, we, I'm glad that you uh, prefaced the conversation uh, giving our credentials. Uh, but yet yeah, we, we've talked about carbon a lot. We've talked about it on the podcast. We've had it as a component of multiple meetings. Um, and Tim talked a little bit, going back to his presentation, mm -hmm. about just the carbon markets that we've talked about and how you participate in those. Philip brought a new equation to this. And again, why is this important? Because we always want our folks to have... Uh, the chance to hear about emerging technologies or emerging opportunities as landowners, uh, particularly for our larger landowners, you know, they things happen on the landscape out there. 
We've talked about solar that's come mm-hmm. onto forest land. We, we, there's a lot of folks interested in using the land for something. Uh, and, and in our case, in addition to growing trees on top of it. So, so Philip talked about you know, carbon capture opportunities. And he talked about it from the standpoint of uh, helping companies reach their climate goals, um, offering forest landowners the opportunity to earn income through sequestration. And what he talked about was capturing CO2 Mm -hmm. and injecting it and storing it into the subsurface or Mm -hmm. underground. Um, we know we take things out of the ground, oil and gas and things of that nature, and we, we store a lot of things, particularly certain gases underground, but now we're moving into opportunities that are emerging to store CO2 underground. And as forest landowners, maybe like a warehouser who owns millions of acres, that provides some opportunity. And as Philip pointed out, a lot of that opportunity is in the Gulf South. Mm-hmm. It's across the South, Arkansas. Um, is a part of that, uh, and we we would have some opportunities here. Um, and, and I think specifically, he mentioned the Gulf South. the The ground, the soil was perfect, or if not perfect, really good conditions for storing some of this carbon. It was very porous and very um, very ideal for some of this technology and this process. That's right. Um, and I'll again preface it by saying. This will be and is, it will be a highly regulated and monitored Mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. It's not a haphazard scenario. Um, But right now they're looking at being able to take it from either a point source, you know, right from uh, an emitter, uh, capture it. Uh, I think it is uh, pressurized, which gives it an ability to be transported more easily and then in, is injected uh, either into, particularly here in Arkansas, probably into a saline formation, mm-hmm. um, which is basically porous sandstone that contains salt water. Um, it could be a, a depleted oil and gas reserve. We have a lot of that down in South Arkansas. Um, but that pore space, as you said, is underground space between the rock and the sand and the sediment. Um, sort of like a sponge, mm-hmm. he said, you yeah. know. And so when you put water into a sponge, those holes in the sponge soak the water up, but the sponge shape itself doesn't really change. And so that was what was kind of explained to us that would happen in the pore space. And so it fills up the pore space between the rocks. And this is not cavernous. This is very small mm-hmm. spaces yeah. down underneath uh, the ground, but, um, and, and let me go to my notes here. Um, when you take the CO2 and it's highly pressurized, it becomes a super critical fluid and it's not quite a gas and it's not quite a liquid. And it will mix with the saline water underground and eventually just become part of the subsurface. So in so many words, <laughs> for my unscientific approach, that's what we're talking mm-hmm. about, a mm-hmm. new carbon capture technology. <clears throat> the world is concerned over reducing our carbon footprint, and this is a way that forest landowners may be involved in helping capture that and storing it in a highly regulated and monitored and safe mm-hmm. way. And I think he mentioned, too, that specifically Louisiana, the state of Louisiana, was kind of already ahead of the game on this. So congratulations to you folks down in Louisiana by already starting some of these bigger projects because there is a minimum amount of acreage that is needed to kind of start doing something like this. Right, right. This the, These are for a little bit larger uh, footprints. Uh, we talked about regulation there's a legislative aspect to this. Legislation has to be passed in states that allow these types of activities to take place. Louisiana is sort of ahead of the game, as mm-hmm. you mentioned. Arkansas had some legislation passed in our last General Assembly back in uh, the January through May period, which kind of brought us into the game a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see how this develops over time. 
And he is definitely someone that I, I hope we can maybe get on the episode to talk a little bit more about this. Again, from a from someone who knows a lot about the carbon capture technology, uh, this is a very kind of emerging new thing that people are very interested in. So hopefully we can get Mr. Blauer here on the actual episode uh, to talk some more details about this. But let's move on to our next group. And it's actually a panel that we had, uh, Max, and it was a slew of people, but we just kind of called this a workforce panel. Like most people, we are also, we in the forestry industry are seeing workforce issues. So we had a group of different people coming on to kind of talk about some of the things that they're looking at when it comes to workforce in the forestry industry. So we had Dr. Sharice Childers, who's with the Arkansas Division of Workforce Services, Chris Isaacson with the Forest Workforce Training Institute and the Alabama Forestry Association, Sean Packer with the JPH Law Firm, Larry Pitts with the Tennessee Forestry Association Workforce Training Program, and our very own Christy Prince with Maxwell Hardwood Flooring here in Arkansas. So, Max, let's just kind of talk about, I don't know if we want to go through each individual person, but just a general overview of what was discussed during this panel. Yeah, and, and uh, just kind of summarizing again, why is this important? Yes. We've talked about it. Uh, our industry faces workforce challenges. We need good, qualified employees. It's a challenge in the agriculture sector in particular because we sort of moved away over time from the land and mm -hmm. understanding its value, but also maybe out of necessity, we've moved to more, at least in our own minds, high-tech opportunities, sort of forgetting that there's a lot of technology in the forest products oh, and yeah. agriculture mm -hmm. industry, uh, but it creates a challenge. We face a challenge from the standpoint of um, most of the trees that are planted. People lo love the fact that we replant our forests. Most of those trees are planted by temporary uh, workers mm -hmm. from, from other countries who come here to work in our industry for a time. They may move to another industry. It could be an, another agriculture field, um, but they are not permanent workers. Uh, and I don't want to get into the whole immigration scenario, mm -hmm. but we use a program called the H-2B program. Row Crop Agriculture uses a program called H-2A, and it is always a challenge to get the number of workers needed to do that type of job. Tree planting is a back-breaking uh, physical challenge. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, uh, American workers have very little interest in doing that type of work. But it has to be done, and it's done at a competitive wage. Uh, again, this is a regulated program, the H-2B program. Only a certain number of temporary workers uh, come to this country each year to do it. Um, you have to pay a competitive wage that's determined uh, through a vast matrix mm -hmm. of, of yeah. types of things. Yeah. Um, and so we talked about the challenges of getting the workers that we needed and how that system works. We talked about, um, particularly with Christy at Maxwell Hardwood Flooring down in Monticello, just the challenges of owning a business in a small rural community. Where do you draw those employees from? Mm -hmm. Do they all live in your hometown or do they come from surrounding areas? Um, what are the education opportunities that are out there for them? What are the incentives that you provide to attract employees? Mm -hmm. uh, and Christy had said that she's, she's tried it all, and it's just frankly a challenge to fill jobs in small rural communities. People gravitate to Little Rock in northwest Arkansas, Fayetteville, Fort Smith, uh, Springdale, Rogers, uh, northeast Arkansas, Jonesboro, but in small towns like Gurdon and Monticello and Louisville, uh, you still need employees. And so how does that small business attract and maintain and, and keep those employees? And we learned from a couple of our association mm -hmm. friends like Chris Isaacson at, at Alabama with the Forestry Works Program and Larry Pitts uh, for, with the Tennessee Forestry Association, how those associations themselves have stepped into the workforce um, game and what are they doing to help their members attract more employees. Mm -hmm. And the work that, that particularly Chris in Alabama uh, has done with their team is really 
uh, pretty phenomenal in that they've created their own complete uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. They do training. Uh, They have multiple partnerships that they administer right out of their own umbrella, so to speak. And so we want to do that. We're involved um, with with Chris and others in the Forestry Works program, mm-hmm. promoting uh, jobs and opportunities within our industry. And we're also involved in a program here that originated in Arkansas, has now spread to multiple states, called Be Pro, Be Proud, which highlights technical career opportunities that don't require a four-year college degree. Mm-hmm. We want to be an association that helps our members find the next generation of qualified workers. We don't just want to report on activities. We would like to move the needle in helping them find these employees. And also, if possible, driving folks to the University of Arkansas at Monticello's College of Forestry, Agriculture, and Natural Resources. We need young people to recognize the opportunities in the timber and forest products industry, whether it's a forester, a paper maker, or someone with an accounting degree that finds a great opportunity in a paper mill or a sawmill out there. So that's kind of what we talked about. What are our opportunities? What are our challenges? And I think it's important to kind of note, too, that, you know, highlighting Chris and highlighting Larry with Alabama and Tennessee, that, again, this isn't an Arkansas-specific problem. This is a problem that is faced through multiple states here in our country, and, and you know, people are trying to tackle this in, in how, any way that they can. And some things work, some things don't. The Forestry Works program with Alabama has uh, shined through some of some of the other things that people have tried, and it seems to be working pretty well. And even you know, Dr. Childers with the um, Arkansas Division of Workforce Services, even from an Arkansas, the state is working to try to provide resources to help people not only in forestry but in other industries here in our state fix some of these workforce problems that they're facing. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, this is not a forced forced industry problem in Arkansas. This is not um, an employment issue Mm -hmm. just, you know, for us here. This is a lot of folks looking for good qualified workers. And so for us to have a relationship with Dr. Childers and her team, it just puts us in a position to try to take advantage of any kind of an opportunity that we have to promote the, the, the timber and forest products industry. And really, I think education is a key mm-hmm. because a lot of times folks don't understand the types of jobs that are available and really the great salaries that we pay in, in the forest products sector, higher than the state and national average, um, and uh, really some, some rewarding not just jobs but career mm-hmm. opportunities uh, within the timber and forest products sector. All right. Well, Max, we're moving on. To our final guests, guests that we had during our general session, and this we talked about drone technology and real-world applications with the help of Johnny Thompson with Landmark Spatial Solutions and our very own Chandler Barton. You might remember him from our Invasive Species episode way back a couple years ago, uh, but he is with the Arkansas Department of Agriculture Forestry Division here in the state. Now, drones is something that has been relatively new and the technology on this has just skyrocketed in the last couple of years. Chandler showed us a picture of the first drone that he had. It was very like boxy and, and stiff looking and kind of big. And then some of the drones that they've been using over the last couple of years, they're very compact, very slim. Uh, so it's kind of wild. Some of the stuff that they're doing, but Max, if you could kind of talk to us about what Johnny and Chandler had to share about drone technology and real world uses. Yeah. Uh, and, and like you say, drones have been around a while mm-hmm. now. We used to have presentations centered on how are we going to use these things? And now we were able to talk about, wow, look at all of the mm-hmm. things that we do with these. People are familiar probably with drones. I would imagine that most of the overhead photography and video that people see these days, whether it's on social media or the news or what have you, it's probably coming from a drone. Oh yeah. Um, this, this has nothing to do with drones, but I'll just equate it. The very first job I ever had was selling office equipment. Mm-hmm. How did I get from there to here? <laughs> Who knows? But we had this thing called the fax machine. Mm-hmm. Remember the heard, fax I've machine? I've heard of them, yeah. You, heard you've of heard them. of them. <laughs> yeah. And so we used to figure out, 
or, or people would ask us, how, how am I going to use this? What am I going to do with it? Well, now we've moved to the fact that a fax machine is a boat anchor somewhere mm -hmm. or it's in a dump. We don't even use the fax machine. It's the same kinds of conversations that we're having about drone technology. We don't ask ourselves how we're going to use it. We look for the next great way to use it. And so Johnny was able to kind of give us some history and show us how they have evolved. Um, we want folks to know, again, that when we use them in forestry, we use them uh, appropriately, professionally. You know, he talked about the difference in being a commercial operator, mm -hmm. which we would have to be from a forestry perspective in someone who does it as a hobby. Uh, we talked about the fact that they are regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. Mm -hmm. and so, again, for those listening, we want you to know that we – we know that these things, we've got rules we need to follow, and we want to do that. Um, and so we talked about then some of the ways that they could uh, be utilized. Uh, the fact that you got to take a test and pass yeah, it yep. to uh, like to a be driver's test to just... be able to operate it, and you better study for it <laughs> uh, because it sounds like it was it's pretty um, uh, pretty intense. And then Chandler was able to. Uh, show us an organization who had and, and what they've done in the real world out there. You know, again, we mentioned that the forestry division provides all of the services that we depend on. And so Ch uh, Chandler was able to show us examples of how they have utilized it and are utilizing it. And let me just mention a few of the things that he talked about. Identifying forest health issues, insects and disease, mm -hmm. Uh, looking at fire and storm damage, uh, you know, monitoring harvesting operations. Have you actually gotten the trees that you intended, or uh, how did you handle uh, a streamside management zone? Did you do it effectively and follow the BMPs? Um, they can look at stand density now and do tree counts and put a dot on every tree that's out there in a stand. You can use it to see whether your regeneration efforts have been successful or have they been a failure. Um, control burn monitoring. You know, uh, the thing that he mentioned that seems to be common sense, but when you think about it, it's so much easier to see a large landscape from above mm -hmm. than it is walking into it. Now, sometimes you have to go and walk right up to the tree, but it's so much easier to see it from above. And he also mentioned how much more effective it was now using the drone technology mm -hmm. than the old days of getting in a plane and flying and looking at the landscape. Mm -hmm. So looking at not only controlled burns and monitoring it, but also the effects of a wildfire or in the midst of a wildfire, they can use that drone technology to see exactly where they need to respond and then get the equipment there. Uh, even uh, fire ignition. He, he yeah, talked I was going to bring this up. Yeah. yeah, he talked about the drones that would carry the little... They call them dragon eggs. They're like little ping pong balls. Yeah. And I loved that. Yeah, it was like watching, um, you know, they must have gone to a Game of Thrones mm -hmm. to collect those. Uh, but fire ignition and herbicide application. We apply herbicides now using drone technology. You can spray about 10 gallons per flight. I think it takes about seven or eight minutes to do that. Um, so... You know, just uh, and then a, just absolutely a ton of just general uh, photography. Mm -hmm. uh, we're using drones right now. Uh, we have a pine decline issue in our state and in various areas across the South that really is is garnering a lot of attention. Absolutely using that kind of technology and then other types of software to be able to show how. Um, the the landscape has changed over time. You know what would what did this look like a year ago? Now what does it look like today? Um, and our folks love to be able to know what that technology is. Drone use is not just for the big guys. It's used by our small family forest owners, mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks out there. So we wanted to not talk about uh, what we 
think we can do with it, but we wanted to show how it's become just an integral everyday tool in force management. And something that I thought was interesting, besides the the drone that dropped little fireballs essentially, was Chandler showed us a photo just to kind of explain some of the things that he was talking about. He showed us a photo of him standing next to a tree that had been through some kind of disease or was dead or something like that. And then he showed us a photo, an aerial view. And, you know, like you said, it's one thing to see the, a, a dead tree or a diseased tree on the ground. But really, once you get that eagle eye view and you can see, OK, here's how many trees are affected. Here's kind of the spread of it. And yes, planes do exist. They have existed for a while now. And that's what Chandler mentioned, that that's what he used to do is go up in a plane, get that eagle eye view, do his counts, whatever he needs to do. But the convenience of having something that does that for you, just in your backpack, you can pull it out. They have a list of a a checklist that they have to follow and rules that they have to follow as an organization. But to be able to pull that out, get it up in the air, get the information, the data that you need, is just more way more convenient than having to find a pilot, rent a plane, or you know, hop up in there and and use your just vision to make your counts or to do whatever it is that you need to do. So I think that was another thing that kind of shined was just the the sheer convenience of having that tool on your quote unquote tool belt to pull out wherever you need it to is, you know, far and away makes these this technology worth it for for folks like Chandler. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, Max, we, we're getting a little long here, um, but but again, this was kind of just an opportunity for us to talk about some a bunch of different issues or, or a bunch of different topics that we we brought up during our annual meeting and presented to our landowners, our, our forestry professionals here in Arkansas. Uh, but is there anything else, I guess, that you want to add? I think one thing I do want to ask real quick is it may not seem like it on the surface to people, especially outside of forestry, how drones and carbon capture technology and uh and workforce all really meld together but if you could just kind of give us a quick little synopsis of how all of these work together and why we chose to present some of these topics this year yeah uh and again at the end of the day everyone wants healthy forests Mm -hmm. and we want everything that they can provide if you like recreation, if you like to hunt and fish, clean water, clean air, uh, you, we want that. And someone has to be responsible for providing that. And it's the timber and forest products community. And so if you've ever wondered what it is that we talk about when we get together, that's just a snapshot of the types of things that we talked about. And, and really very little of it was about cutting trees. Mm-hmm that people have a lot of concern about sometimes. What we talk about most of the time is what can we do to ensure that we're growing those healthy forests. And it takes the people that work on the landscape and in our mills from a workforce perspective. It takes the technology that we can adapt and apply to the landscape to make us better at what we do. It takes knowing about how to grow the best trees possible Um, It takes partnerships and collaboration, and all of that goes into providing the healthy force that we depend on. And that's who we are, and that's what we do, and that's why we want to bring these types of messages to people so that if you're sitting out there wondering about who that group of folks, uh, who, who are they? Uh, can I trust them? What kind of people are they? What kind of values do they have? And what is their overall goal and objectives? We want you to know all of that, and you, we want you to to feel good about what is happening in the forests of Arkansas. All right. Well, Max, thank you for joining me. Again, a very long walk for from your office to here in our own very own conference room, but uh, I want to thank you for joining us and going back through these presentations and kind of summarizing everything up for everybody. You bet. Last time when we did this, we got to go eat fish afterwards. So is that what we're going to get to do now? Hey, you're the boss. You you, you get to call the shots. All right. (laughs) I'm following your lead. Uh, But no, we also want to thank you, dear listener, for joining us again this month. Um, And something I haven't quite done in a while that I kind of want to do while we're here, give us a rate. Rate us five stars if you think we're doing good. Uh, Send us, you know, let us know what we're doing wrong or what what you'd like to see maybe coming up here in the future. But give us a rate on wherever you're listening. Uh, we'd sure appreciate that. And I want to give another special shout out and thank you to our sponsors this month, Farm Credit. We absolutely love them and, and really appreciate their continued support of 
all things AFA because they were our premier sponsor this year at our annual meeting, and they have been for a couple years now. So we really appreciate their continued support of everything that we're doing here at the Arkansas Forestry Association. I also want to give a n- another special shout out and thank you to some guy named Rob slash Rob McCormick for the use of our theme song, The Same Love. That's off of his album, The Folkster. You can find more of his music on Spotify. And as always, we'll have a link to his website in the description of this episode. So make sure you join us next month when we'll have a new topic, a new discussion, and a new voice of force.